Not too shabby. All right, looks like the path is clear. All right, so you're gonna give us the extra horsepower to get up this hill, right? Two or three. Two or three horsepower? Yes. And you smoothed out the road so there's no bumps, right? Right, no okay. Guarantee. All right, bumps are guaranteed, got it. <laughs> All right, so we got that really steep grade right there. <laughs> it's not very steep. Uh, to go up, and the four-wheeler's not gonna do it, so Anna's, Anna's providing the yoinky power. If it suddenly feels light back there, I'm gone. I fell off. Don't bother coming looking for me, just keep going. Keep going? Yeah. All right, we'll get her done. Okay. For as much fun as that was, that should just be a video. In the scheme of getting to the log, that was a level three. guys I'm super excited to do this video I've been wanting to do this for a long time and well we have the perfect kind of scenario or setup where I feel like we can really go through this topic carefully if you've been following our channel for a while you know that we've spent a bit of time with our bandsaw mill of course we're not professional sawmillers but I think we can share a bit of insights from the things we learned from sawmilling our timber frame if you haven't been following our channel for a while jump back there's an entire ridiculous video series where we actually take 55 logs in three weeks and we turn them into the timbers that would become the timber frame for the house that we're building. Um, if you haven't seen the videos, maybe you've been following us for a while, but you maybe weren't there in the early days, jump back. There's actually a few videos back there where we use a chainsaw mill and a pine tree up on this hill and we make lumber that would become the deck where we put our wood-fired hot tub. We learned a lot from that process. In the early days, we had a lot less tools, and so we had to kind of think more ingenuitively to get the work done. There was a lot learned there. So part of what we want to share today is the lessons learned from that project, and then lessons we learned from milling that timber frame. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and assume that if you're watching this video, you're not a professional saw miller, and you're not really looking to buy a industrial industrial or a high-end mill. I think what we're really looking at here is what can a person get on a budget, that's a relative term, to do a reasonable amount of projects. So really it's that, it's that spot on the value curve where you have the least investment and the most utility. We're not really gonna be talking about high-end stuff where you have to put a lot of money down. We're gonna try to keep it focused on things that maybe are approachable for the average homeowner or the weekend DIYer. The first thing that I want to say about sawmills is that there is no perfect sawmill. I think some of these debates get to be ridiculous, people trying to prove their case. And I could just say from our experience that I think if you could own both, own a, both a band, band saw mill and a chainsaw mill. In fact, we have two chainsaw mills and that's because even among chainsaw mills, there's no perfect mill. And of course, not part of our discussion today is gonna to be portable circular sawmills, which is another conversation. We don't have one of those. Um, we have watched other people use them. We've, we don't know anybody with one, but we can see that they have a certain place we're not gonna talk about those in this video. You'll have to go elsewhere for that fun content. I would say that we've kind of well established the getting to the log dilemma. And I think if there's anywhere I could start the conversation with somebody about whether to get a chainsaw mill or a bandsaw mill, I think the, really, the question to me becomes, where are your logs and can you get to them? Or how are you going to get to them? Or more importantly, how are you going to get them to the mill? Those are really where these two sawmills completely diverge. And if you answer that question, it's almost like pretty quickly, it's black and white. Do you want this sawmill or that one? 
First, let's kind of talk about the mills that we're gonna be referring to today so we know we've got them straight. So the mill to my right here is a Granberg 36 inch Alaskan mill. And this is obviously designed for horizontal operation. The chainsaw slides, the bar slides through that guide into this guide and it has a bar uh, protector or bar cover there to protect the end of the bar so you don't touch the chain. And that's it, that's all you get. It's pretty simple. I think these are around $300, give or take. They come as a kit, you do have to assemble them. And we'll talk, this, talk about this a little bit later in more depth, but these bars that you see here are actually replaceable and this mill can be shortened uh, quite a bit, I think around to 18 inches or so, and I think that can get as long as like six feet or even longer. Point is, it gets absolutely massive. This little mill here is actually also from Granberg. It's what they call their mini mill, and this guy is actually meant to be run vertically. So the chainsaw bar slides through this gap, and then these screws cinch down to the bar and the chainsaw is running vertically. And then this shield is just to keep chips and dust and things from actually hitting you in the face. So you push on this handle and you push on the power head and that's how this little guy works. I think these are just over $100, maybe 150 or so. And really the only limit on this one is how big you want your saw to be that you stick in that gap. There's really no need to extend it or anything like that. Um, you can put as long a saw in there as you want. And then we've got the big mill, big mill meaning relative to the chainsaw mills. This is an LT15 from Woodmiser. And currently it's actually mounted on the trailer kit. They call it an LT15 Go. So this is not how you would buy it from Woodmiser. You'd have to purchase the accessory kit. And they include jacks, which are leveling jacks, and that's part of the trailer package. And they include a tongue. So when this comes from the factory, it actually has three bed sections, one, two, three, and the mill head. And then they have legs that go into the bed sections. So we've, we've moved this from the configuration we were using to mill our timber frame to the trailer, which makes it more portable. The one caveat to putting it on the trailer is that we lost quite a bit of length, milling length. So we had five bed sections, which is part of why we went with an LT15, not an LT40 or 35, etc. The LT15, you can attach multiple bed sections and extend the overall length. I'm not sure if you can do that to those other models, but my, my recollection is that you cannot. They're kind of fixed to the trailer system that they come mounted on. So we have three, or excuse me, we have two more bed sections that can be added to this mill, but you have to remove it from the trailer and use the legs. So in that configuration, it's not portable, but we needed that because the longest timber for our timber frame was 25 feet, five inches. And the log that we were milling was 27 feet. So we had a little bit of fudge room on both ends and therefore we needed those extra bed sections. This mill also has the 25 horsepower engine upgrade. It's, I think the factory engine, the original, the stock engine, I think is 17 horsepower, something like that. And so this is a uh, a little bit bigger engine and I felt like for the for the price of the upgrade it was justified It definitely has no problem going through Softwood I've never milled hardwood with it. So I can't speak to that. They do offer a diesel upgrade to this um, Do your research on that engine There's pros and cons to that and everybody will have to make that decision for themselves the 25 horse upgrades pretty straightforward I think most people probably opt for that. We chose to go with the rope uh, moving system, whatever it's called, that moves the mill head. They do have an automated system or electric system that you can use to, to minimize work fatigue, worker fatigue, but we chose not to use that. We have milled a lot of wood with this, and we're talking about homeowners here, not, not professionals, and we feel like this system works super, it's adequate. The limitations of this machine really come down to the length of the log, which we talked about with the bed sections, but the throw so this can mill a 27 inch wide cut, but if you notice here where the V belt comes up, it, it is limited on the height of that cut. So you might get about three inches or four inches or so before you hit that guard. There's probably a number published by Woodmiser. So if you want to cut a larger 
a taller cut, you're gonna be narrowed down to this part of the throat and maybe maybe 14 or 15 inches or so total. So jumping back to the chainsaw mills, I think it's pretty obvious that there's really no limit to the length of log that you can mill with these. Really, it's <laughs> limited to the guides that you're gonna use. We'll talk about those in just a second, and those will become integral to the initial cuts on the chainsaw or the Alaskan mill and all cuts on the mini mill. But otherwise, you could hypothetically just mill forever. There's really no limit to the length on either of the chainsaw mills. Got a little bit ahead of myself there. I forgot to mention that the LT15 in its base configuration, no trailer, uh, without the bigger engine, etc., I think can be had for just over $5,000, maybe $5,300. I'm not sure if there's freight in there or not. But then you start adding in accessories like the PVs, the log ramps, the trailer package. It's not a stretch to you know get the price of this machine upwards of $10,000 with all the accessories. But you could start small and then buy things as you have the income too. So keep that in mind. Which brings me back to the chainsaw mills. I think it's not fair to look at the cost of the mill without looking at the cost of the saw. So with the chainsaw mills, a lot of the cost is actually gonna be in your saw. The mills are pretty affordable. And I think we can talk about this later, kind of in the, in the, the wrap up pros and cons, but the cost of the saw is really gonna dictate how much fun or how much pleasure you get from this process versus how much struggle. With the Alaskan sawmills, there's kind of a general consensus that the bigger the saw, the better. Of course, at some point, the saws get so heavy that they're hard to manhandle and they're not really that practical but you're gonna work the saw less hard and it's gonna do the job just smoother versus a smaller saw is just gonna work harder, it's gonna shorten its life and it's just gonna be a lot more operator fatigue. That said, we have found that the smaller saw works pretty well with the mini mill. It just has kind of a, they just work well together. The, the small saw is not too heavy to handle, it's not too heavy to lift, it fits nicely in the mini mill. So with this chainsaw and that mini mill, your, your total investment might be under 400 bucks if you bought the saw brand new. This is really where chainsaw mills make a lot of sense. If you already have a saw, you've already got the heavy lifting done financially, you just need to add the mill to your toolkit. The larger saw here can run upwards of $1,000 or even $1,300 if you buy one new. They can be had used shop carefully, sometimes people neglect saws and you buy a lemon and it just is gonna make the whole experience miserable. So if you buy a premium large saw and an Alaskan sawmill, you might be looking at close to $2,000 really, once you have all the things that you need, including an extra bar, some chains, uh, the sawmill, and there's some other things that you'll need, we'll talk about those later, to get up and running really well with an Alaskan sawmill is only half the price of this bandsaw mill. So think about that. Another accessory you're gonna need to get your chainsaw mills working, in the case of the mini mill, you're going to need at least a board. And it needs to be a really high quality, straight and true, flat and level board. And that chainsaw mill actually comes with this little triangulated rail, which serves as a guide for the mill and you wanna attach that with the included screws to this board, and that's gonna be the guide that your saw runs on. This ladder, I just grabbed from the house. It's not actually included with the sawmill. Everybody kinda of has their own way of doing this, but the Alaskan sawmill needs something that's very flat for the guide to run on. That way, it actually creates the plane for your cut. And this is kind of goes back to that conversation about the limits of length. So the, the longer your guide board, the longer you're gonna be able to cut. The longer your ladder or whatever you choose to use as a guide will determine the maximum length of your cut. We actually, when we started with our Alaskan sawmill, went the very, very budget route. And we built our own ladder out of one by four pine and it worked, it got the job done. The problem was it didn't handle the weather being outside well, we had no way to protect it and the ladder torqued and tweaked and so it ended up in the burn pile. It wasn't valuable anymore. So if you want something that's more long lasting and it's more accurate, uh, something like an aluminum ladder is not a bad idea. There were benefits to the wood though we could screw through the wood into the log to attach it to create some 
stability because once you put that big saw into an Alaskan sawmill, it gets very heavy and you're going to want something very rigid to keep it running properly. So just keep that in mind. You're going to need more accessories to get going with chainsaw milling than the mill and the saw. So that brings me full circle back to my original comment about which mill is the best one. And really for me, I start that conversation with people about the log. Can you move the log? If you're like us and we have these trees that we just dropped um, and we, let's say we only had a four wheeler, you're gonna have a really hard time moving these logs around, right? And so in that situation, if you don't have equipment or you don't have someone who can put the log where you need it, you're almost forced into using the chainsaw mill. We kind of demonstrated earlier how fun it is trying to get the mill to the log in the case of a bandsaw mill. So if you've got super flat ground with no rocks, it's roomy, and you can drive right up to a log, hey, that's great. I think for a lot of people that's probably not going to be the case. Um, and it also creates a lot of other problems which we can't really talk about today, it's just too much. But in a nutshell, you really want good, even workspaces for your mill. It just makes more work for you and you're going to get an inferior product if you're having to move your sawmill all the time. The setup, the calibration and everything takes time. And the chainsaw mill, it doesn't care. The log can be sitting left, right, upside down or backwards as long as the guide is installed true, that's going to work really well for you. One trick we can offer, when we did our timber frame, we actually set the sawmill up in a location that we really thought through and given our property, it was the best spot to put a sawmill. That's kind of how it works. It's not going to be the ideal spot, it's just the best spot on your property. And we had a log truck deliver the logs right next to the mill. And so all we had to move them was maybe 8 to 10 feet to the mill. We never had to move the sawmill. That worked really good. So that's one caveat. If you can have the logs brought to you and placed right next to the sawmill every single time, you know, a band sawmill, you can kind of cheat a little bit that way. Obviously, if that's not your situation, you're, you're kind of forced into using equipment. I can tell you that we bought the log ramps. We bought several accessories for this. We did have the winch, but we did not use it. So I'll just admit that right out of the gate. But we tried to use the PVs to roll logs up onto the mill. We happened to have a green larch tree or tamarack, and I think it was only 20 feet or so. And we tried to roll it up on that mill, and I'm pretty sure we thought we were gonna die because the thing is so heavy and those ramps are steep and it's just difficult. We'll just say that. So think a lot about the log. And if you if it's more convenient for you to go to the log, that may be kind of heading your, your buying decision in that direction. But like I said, that's not the only consideration, so we, we can't say anything in this conversation is black and white. I think it's only fair to admit that we actually used equipment to lift the logs onto the mill, and even then, the equipment was struggling because the logs that we were carrying were 27 to 28 feet long, 20 inch diameter, and they weighed about two to 3,000 pounds. And so even with equipment, it's still not gonna be smooth sailing necessarily. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if you wanna buy a bandsaw mill and you wanna really get good and have a lot of productivity, you're probably gonna need some equipment, which takes the price of the sawmill and just explodes it exponentially uh, because the cost of equipment is probably gonna be way higher than the cost of the sawmill. So in this scenario that we have here where we've got two trees side by side, the ground's fairly level, there's quite a bit of room to walk around. We could, probably with the four-wheeler and or block and tackle or some amount of tooling, we could buck these trees up, we could wiggle them and squirm them around, and we could probably get them onto the mill at a reasonable length. Obviously, our lim we're limited to about 16 feet on this sawmill right now as it's configured right now. So that length is probably manageable with this size of a tree, which is about 14 to 16 inch diameter. But we've got a scenario up on the hill here that is just a flat out no-go uh, for the bandsaw mill unless you have some way to move the tree. This is one of our old chainsaw milling spots. You can see the strap across these trees and we have our bucking stands and a bunch of sawdust. We actually dropped a pine tree up on this hillside, but you can see it's quite steep, it's very rocky, and so it's very difficult to work up there. We ended up using block and tackle and a winch and cutting that tree up and then rolling them down here and just very patiently getting them around all these trees and then putting them on bucking stands using a winch and a, a pulley and we were able to chainsaw mill all of them right here and that was 
that made it easy to move them as boards or slabs that we could handle elsewhere. I think knowing what I know about chainsaw milling, I would almost be somewhat tempted to actually mill a log like this in place. Two reasons, one, gravity's on your side. So if you could set up your guide such that you can saw downhill, you're actually gonna be doing a fraction of the work. Gravity is gonna be helping you a bunch. The only downside is you've gotta carry all those boards down a rocky hillside. So next thing that I wanna talk about is kind of lumber versus timbers. We've milled both and we've milled both on both saws. And there's not a right or wrong answer here, but I think you have to really think it through. With our timber frame, we milled those on the band saw and the amount of waste that we created in that process was still staggering. Early on, we thought, oh, you know, the bandsaw mill is super efficient, it won't be much. But 55 logs, and I don't even know how many cuts later, we had generated yards, yards of sawdust. And that's astonishing given the fact that the bandsaw has extremely narrow kerf. The kerf on this saw is a total of one eighth of an inch. The blade is extremely thin, and therefore, you produce very little waste. With the chainsaw, the kerf is one half inch. So it is four times more waste per cut than the bandsaw. And that really starts to add up. The more cuts you make, the more waste you generate. When you measure the distance between those two teeth, it comes out to a whopping half an inch. Two things, that's a ton more waste and a ton more effort. So with the chainsaw mill, it's like gallons of sawdust per cut. Unless you need a bunch of sawdust, that's just wasted material that you could be using to build something. So why does that relate to lumber and timbers? Well, if you're gonna mill timbers, it's not quite as big of a deal. With a timber, you might be making four cuts total. If you start to cut lumber, you be, might, might be making a dozen cuts or more. So when we made the lumber for our hot tub deck, we figured that for every three boards, we wasted a board. That's a lot of waste, a lot of work. So with the bandsaw mill, if you're gonna make lumber, you really wanna look at that because you're just gonna be using a lot less wood for sawdust and it translates to a lot less work also. You'll feel that when you're running a chainsaw mill it feels like you're removing a half an inch of wood. I suppose when we say it's, it's, a, it's a tighter race when we're talking about timbers, we should disclose that accuracy should probably also be a consideration there because the bandsaw mill is gonna generate a much more accurate cut as well as use less waste. So if you need precision, well, now you're kind of leaning more toward the bandsaw. We were able to mill our timbers on our bandsaw so tightly that when we ran the planer over them, Alyssa was taking just a fraction of a fraction of an inch off. And when we squared those timbers with a square, they were dead on. Very precise work. If you take the time to calibrate the sawmill and maintain that calibration as you bump and move logs and flip logs over and do all this stuff, you're gonna be moving the adjustments on the mill. So it takes patience. But these bandsaw mills, when they're tuned up and they're running properly with a sharp blade, are capable of extremely good precision. The lumber, on the other hand, that we made with our chainsaw mill was good enough for our decking. It probably had inconsistencies as much as 330 seconds or so, which is okay. We were able to kind of mitigate that by routering or beveling the edges to make them round so they were less inconsistent. But you're just gonna have fatigue with the chainsaw mill and it's gonna result in tipping and tilting and such, and you're just gonna have some amount of inaccuracies. So unless you plan to plane it, or you just don't need things to be that accurate, uh, the chainsaw mill's probably not gonna be a good fit. I just remembered one other thing that I think is important to mention about moving logs. It's really important to minimize dragging logs. When you do, you pick up a lot of dirt. There's already quite a bit of dirt in bark and things that will dull your blades, no matter whether it's the bandsaw or the chainsaw mill. But if you have to drag your logs, you're gonna be even worse off. It's gonna go through a lot of your blade sharpening very quickly. I'll tell you that the chainsaw mill, sharpening gets really old really fast. We'll talk about sharpening a little bit more later. Let's talk a little bit about slab work. I think a lot of people are really excitable by slabs. It's kind of a trend. People are really hot on slabs right now. And so the chainsaw mill uh, is something that people see people doing slabbing with. And that's because it is so versatile. Like I mentioned, Granberg offers extensions for these bars on this chainsaw mill. And so you have to get a longer bar 
And there are even instances where you need two power heads, that's right, two chainsaws, one on each side to run this because it's so massive, but you can make slabs that are as big as your wildest dreams. However, with the bandsaw mill, it starts to get a little more fuzzy. There are people on the internet who have built slabbing specific bandsaw mills. They're out there and they've got a, they're big, but they can do the slab work. As far as a commercial option that you can just buy and drive up to your driveway, you'll have a few less options. They do make a 36 inch wide LT15 that can do slab work up to 36 inches. But remember, you're gonna be limited right here where the throat gets the most narrow to the depth of that slab. Of course, I don't think most people will be cutting 10 inch thick slabs, so you're probably good to go. And there are some options out there for a larger slab, uh, but you start to get a lot less options. Something interesting to me, just going right back to the conversation about either moving the log or going to the log. One thing I've noticed for the folks that have built these massive slabbing bandsaws, that moving that massive log to the massive bandsaw yeah, that's really difficult. So at that point, it's almost like, why aren't we using a chainsaw mill? They probably have their reasons, but I think it's worth considering. I think it's easy to get starry-eyed by the bandsaws, but there's a reason that Alaskan uh, sawmills are used for slabbing every single day, even in urban situations. My imagination is that those huge logs that they're slabbing could weigh 10, 15, or even 20,000 pounds. So without some contraption or some amount of equipment, getting that log moved is just going to be difficult. So it may be better to just grab a big chainsaw mill, grab a buddy, mill it in place, and then it's much easier to move. Let's talk a little bit about setup and portability. So obviously this sawmill is fairly portable with the wheel kit and everything. It's got leveling jacks. But I can tell you that taking the time to get the sawmill really well set up is gonna make your life a lot easier as you start cutting. You're gonna make a lot less mistakes, you're gonna have a lot less twisting cuts, or we even had one that had a hump in the cut because this bed section was a little bit higher than those there. So if you're going for precision, really taking your time to set this sawmill up well is an act of patience, and it's not something that you wanna do a lot. Of course, some of the other sawmills are much quicker to set up. They've got leveling legs uh, that, that do a lot of that work for you. But it does take time. Don't be fooled. You can't just drive up and throw a log on this and expect it to make lumber. They're not that amazing. So there's a time commitment there. Getting the, the chainsaw mill set up is also an act of patience, but I would say it's actually a little bit quicker. First, you don't have to move the log. It's already sitting there. It's a matter of cutting it to the length that you want and making a little bit of room for your, your sawmill to get in there. And then setting up your guide very patiently and then making your top cut in the case of the Alaskan or setting up your guide and making your first cut with the mini mill. Once that's done, these two saws are actually pretty quick because they reference that initial cut. If you do a great job, all the lumber that you get will therefore be good. If you do a bad job, it's all gonna be bad. We found that as we bumped and moved the logs loading this sawmill, we were constantly calibrating it partly because we were after extremely high precision timbers coming off the mill. We don't have a planer, we had no way to square them, so they had to be square coming off the sawmill. And because of that, every time we would load a log, the sawmill would get jostled. We tried to be gentle, but you be gentle with a 3,000 pound log and let me know how it goes. It's difficult. I see a lot of people think that they're gonna load this with a forklift or something like that. Good luck. Logs are round, they just roll. So you use whatever method makes sense, but just expect to have to spend some time calibrating. We kind of came up with a way of doing that and checking each log and checking each cut because as soon as you get one cut that's wonky, boy, it's a rodeo after that. So just because you get this set up once doesn't mean you're done. It's a constant calibration process. Let's talk a little bit about sharpening. So with your chainsaw mill, and this is an example of an Alaskan mill, so we have a 36 inch bar here, and these chains are actually unique. They're not a crosscut chain, they're what's called a ripping chain, and they're filed differently, and they also have a different tooth arrangement. And so you'll have to maintain these chains separately. Therefore, you're going to need a way to sharpen these because they're at 10 degrees, your normal sharpener will not work. So you've got one more doohickey or gadget that you're gonna to need to maintain your chain. And sharpening is a constant process, especially if you don't debark your logs, which if you're in the woods, you may not do that. Or 
There may be other reasons why you wouldn't do that. So sharpening can be a very laborious process. Uh, a lot of people take these in and have someone else sharpen them. You can see the little guide there is actually saying 30 degrees, but you can see that the, the chain is very different than the little mark on the tooth. So we kept three of these chains when we were chainsaw milling. We would chainsaw mill until all of them were dull, and then we would pay someone else to sharpen them. It was just easier, and you're getting a more consistent sharpen. Trust me, when you're doing that much work, you want all the sharp chain that you can get. You could do this in your garage, either by hand or with a machine, but again, that's gonna add a little bit of cost and labor to your operation. Sharpening on the bandsaw mill is a very different experience. So we purchased three boxes of blades. I believe there was 10 blades per box. We would go through a full box of blades, ship it off for sharpening, open the second box, and then by the time then, the first box was usually back. But just in case it wasn't, we had a third box to keep us running because we were on a very tight timeline. I think the cost per blade for sharpening is about $7. And then you have freight going both directions. A box of blades brand new, I think it's around $300 or so, about 30 bucks a blade, give or take. They can be sharpened about five to six times depending on how much damage you do to them. So you can get a lot of life out of a set of blades. We had about three or four sharpenings total cutting an entire timber frame for our house. And we also milled all the lumber for our loft and we milled lumber that we used to line the sips and we made lumber that we gave to a friend and we've done other projects since then with the sawmill and we're still going on all of our original blades. So blades are a bit of an investment. We did find that using a dullish blade for our first cut to get through the bark was a good idea. And then once we were into the good wood, we kept a sharp blade on and our cuts were super clean. But expect to spend a little bit of money on sharpening to keep your bandsaw going. You can buy a sharpener for these, but for a lot of people it may be easier, more accurate, and more affordable to have someone else, a professional service, do it for you. Like I mentioned with the chainsaw mill, we had three chains. So once the chain gets dull, we would just switch the chain out until we were out of chains. If you have 10 blades for your wood miser, you can go for several days easily. And it's a matter of opening the covers, taking the dull blade out, putting a fresh sharp blade in, closing the covers and you're back to saw milling. So from an efficiency standpoint, the wood miser or a bandsaw mill really shines. Keep in mind that there are actually different types of blades available for, available for bandsaw mills. They're at different filing angles for hardwoods and softwoods. So if you're gonna be doing hardwood, you may want to invest in those blades. If you're gonna be doing both, now you've got quite a menagerie of blades to maintain. It wouldn't be fair to compare these two if we didn't talk about storage. Chainsaw mills will fit in the back of a pickup or on a shelf, and there's pretty much no maintenance, no wear and tear, and no upkeep. Uh, you do have a lot of that stuff on the chainsaw, but the assumption here is that you have a chainsaw and you're already using it anyway, which means you already have that expense anyway. The sawmill, on the other hand, is kind of a one-dimensional tool. You can't drive it, you can't sleep in it, so it's just a sawmill. It does take room to store, and there are things that need constant or frequent maintenance and upkeep. Is it intense? No, but it still takes care. So we keep our sawmill covered. You've got an oil that you've got to change, and there are things that require lubrication. Even if you're not using it, it still needs to be protected from the weather. The assumption here is that you take good care of your chainsaw and your, your chainsaw mill, so those things are gonna be protected from the weather anyway. So if you have little space, or if you're maybe in an urban situation and parking or, or something like that is a difficult situation, a bandsaw mill is starting to look a lot less appealing. On that note, let's talk a little bit about longevity. Chainsaw milling with a chainsaw is gonna shorten its life. It's a fairly laborious process. Is it gonna be exponential? No. Well, I guess that depends on how sharp you keep your chains. If you're running a dull chain all the time, you're gonna smoke your saw. So saws are gonna be a big part of your expense. Of course, if you're not doing a ton of it, it's not gonna be a big deal. But I can tell you that you're probably almost never gonna wear out these bandsaw mills. If you get a quality one, uh, you know, we see them that are 30 or 40 years old, people are still buying them and using them. 
they might have to do some service and some upkeep on them, but they're really never gonna wear out. And the thing about the chainsaws is eventually that chainsaw is gonna go away. You probably have to do a rebuild or something on it. So just keep that in mind that this is very much a long-term investment and it has resale value. Uh, people purchase these all the time. We see them flying through Facebook groups and Craigslist and things like that. We love seeing them drive down the road. So. If you're looking for something that's a safe investment, a bandsaw mill is an attractive option. Well, there you have it. That's kind of our two cents after doing projects with both chainsaw mills and bandsaw mills. Of course, there's a lot of minutia and other details that we left out of this video. You'll have to make that decision for yourself. If in doubt, go see some of these mills operate and try to get in touch with people who have these mills and maybe get a chance to operate one. Um, that'll maybe give you a little bit more insight into what'll work well for you. We have a hunch though, the things that we shared will really narrow it down for you. Do you have equipment? Do you need to move the log? What's your upfront investment? Those things will really narrow it down for you. I guess the answer to the, to the big question is which sawmill's best? Both. If you can, try to own both. And if you can, try to own both chainsaw mills too because you'll find yourself not using them all the time, but when you need them, they're fantastic. <laughs>